So verse 15, overeating, exertion, talkativeness, adhering to rules, being in the company of common people, and unsteadiness, wavering mind, are the six causes which destroy yoga. According to Hatha Yoga, there are six, six major factors which prevent yoga or union from occurring. In Hatha Yoga, union means uniting the two energy forces in the body, i.e. the pranic and mental energy flowing in Ida and Pingala nadis. Usually, these, four, these two forces do not operate simultaneously. Either the mental force predominates or the vital energy is dominant. Hatha yoga is the process of balancing the flow of these, all, these two alternating forces to bring perfect physical and mental equilibrium and awakening of Shushamana and Kundalini. All branches of yoga unite these two energies and channel them through the third nadi, Shushamana. The three nadis, Ida, Pingala, and Shushamana, terminate in Aja Chakra, the psychic center, which is situated in the region of the medulla umbilicata and the pineal gland. Through the practice of yoga, and Ida and Pingala are equalized. Shushamana is activated and Aja Chakra is awakened. Ida is connected to the left nostril and the right brain hemisphere. Pingala is collected to the right nostril and left brain hemisphere. In the same way that the right hemisphere governs the left side of the body, on the pranic level, Ida also controls the functions on the left side of the body. Likewise, Pingala and the left hemisphere govern the right side of the body, just as the brain hemisphere and the nostrils alternate their functions in 90 minute cycles, so do in Ida and Pingala. Ida and the right hemisphere activate an introverted state of awareness, orientation in space, artistic, creative, and musical ability. Conversely, Pingala and the left hemisphere externalize the awareness. Your stomach becomes logical, sequential, mathematical. Your stomach, my goodness. Your approach becomes logical, sequential, mathematical, and analytical. Ida Nadi controls the subconscious activities, whereas Pingala is responsible for the conscious and dynamic functions. When these forces are balanced and operating simultaneously, then both nostrils are active. This indicates that Shushumana Nadi is functioning. Usually, this occurs for one to two minutes between each 90 minute cycle. The object of Hatha yoga practice is to increase the duration and flow of Shushumana and the period when both nostrils flow simultaneously so that a balance is created in the physical and mental functions. When the mind and body are not functioning in harmony, there is a division between the physical and mental rhythms, which eventually leads to sickness. When a sadhaka is in the process of uniting the two opposite forces of Ida and Pingala, he must avoid all activities which waste energy and distract the mind. One major obstacle to yoga or union is overeating. When the body is overloaded with food, it becomes sluggish and the mind becomes dull. Over a period of time, toxins build up in the body, constipation sets in, and the whole physical mental system becomes blocked. If the body is toxic and lethargic, how can you expect to make project, progress in sadhana? Whatever sadhana you will do, you do will act as purification. So you, you will just be spending your time removing toxins and disease. However, if you avoid overeating and its consequences, then the sadhana you are doing will help you to progress more quickly. Swami Sivananda of Rish Rishikesh and many other yogis have said that the stomach should be half filled with food, one quarter with water, and one quarter with air. The next advice is that Hatha Yogi is that the Hatha Yoga Yogi should avoid overexerting or overstraining the body 
and mind. Hard physical labor or intense mental worth work taxes one of the energy systems and can create further imbalance between the two energies. The Hatha Yogi has to conserve and build up his store of energy for spiritual purposes, excuse me, and should not waste it in performing an unnecessary physical or mental feats. Too much talking dissipates vital energy and wastes time, which could be better spent in awakening the inner awareness. Gossiping with people who have low morals, base consciousness, and sensuous desires cannot enlighten your soul. Rather, their negative vibrations may influence you. Social situations and irrelevant discussions definitely distract the mind from sadhana. Although Swat Marama advises that a sadhaka should not adhere to strict rules and regulations, the guru's instructions must be followed. As far as social rituals and religious doctrines are concerned, it is unnecessary that they be maintained for spiritual progress. Sadhana is not dependent on social morals, nor are its effects promoted by religious practices. Adhering to rules makes one narrow-minded. Yoga is meant to expand the consciousness, not to limit it. A yogi should have a free and open mind. If you are accustomed to taking a cold bath every morning before practice, and one day you have no water, you should not be disturbed. Take a bath when you can get water. Your mind should be flexible and you should be able to adjust to circumstances. Unsteadiness means an imbalanced body metabolism, inability to hold one posture for a period of time and a wavering mind. Obviously, yoga cannot be achieved under these conditions. When there is a physical, mental, emotional, and psychic imbalance, the energy is dispersed. But if the energy is channeled properly, all the bodily systems become stable and physical and mental steadiness develop automatically. Unsteadiness also means wavering willpower. One day you get up at 3 a.m. and the next morning you sleep till 7 a.m. because you feel lazy. When there is an inconsistency and irregularity in lifestyle, further imbalance in the body will ensue. An unswerving mind and steady body cultivate yoga. If you can live in a hermitage as described in the previous sloka, all these obstacles will be avoided naturally. However, if you are unable to live in such a place, try to develop the habit of avoiding all activities which are useless, time-consuming, and energy-depleting, and channel all your desires and actions into spiritual ventures. Apart from these obstacles, the Tantra Raja Tantra mentions that the six obstacles to yoga are kama, lust, krodha, anger, lobha, greed, moha, infatuation, abhimana, pride, mada, arrogance. The six obstacles described, described in Hatha Yoga and in Tantra are interwoven and interlinked. Those of Tantra have a broader scope and pinpoint the obstacles to actually be the mental attitude. I'll pause there for a second. I thought this was great. I just love this. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, obviously, it, it, I, I was sort of thinking about it needs to be a little tweaked for where we're living and how, and how we live. Yeah. But it's so on target. All of these things waste energy. Um, and, and, but what was also, well, the wasting of energy to me is, is fairly clear because I'm always like saying, no, don't read this stupid <laughs> novel because you know it's dumb. Don't read it. You're going to read a novel? Read something that's a little bit life giving, you know? <laughs> So I get that part, but the paragraph that says, avoid overexerting or overstraining the body and mind, I some, it, it's, is interesting to me um, because it is possible to do that. You know, it, it is possible 
to do something that's too much physically or to do something that's too much mentally, even though you love it and it, and it feels good while you're doing it, just, to, you know, there, there really comes a time where you should say, stop, take a break from this, slow down, do something else, breathe, go wash a dish, you know? Yeah. Cause it can be, it's, it's a trap in some ways, but I, it, you know, I never thought of it in quite this way. So. I know. I feel like that chapter, I need to like go back and like, you're like type, like write down notes and stuff. Yes. I like the overeating part of what your stomach should look like. Yeah. I thought that was pretty funny and it's, it's, but he's, he's right. Oh, he's totally right. Yeah. Nothing like a, a house full of dead bugs after Thanksgiving dinner for, you know, and the bugs are the people, the slugs lying on the couch. But, but even setting that aside, it's, it's true. Yeah. You know, it's, I just love her writing. I love the way she writes this book. Yeah. It's very like, clear. And she's constantly, Kramer just woke up. He's Hello, Kramer. Constantly, um, I mean, she's constantly reminding us. She's, I, I just find her such a good teacher in the sense that she's just, like in the sutras, there was always just an assumption that you knew what something was, I felt like. And in here, even if she's already explained something, she's constantly reminding us. And she does it in such a way where it's not repetitive to me. Yeah. It's not boring. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I totally agree. And the other message from this, thing which is something I wish I had learned 40 years ago is you know if you set things up in such a way that you're living moderately you don't have to do so much cleanup of any mess afterwards so it's uh, <laughs> it's like and and she says if you have to do a lot of cleanup then you're then the efforts that you have to make for cleanup cannot be used for moving further in in your practice and no matter where you want to go in your practice that just strikes me as being it's it's reasonable it's common sense yeah but she says it clearly like you said and it's a wonderful reminder of you know you want to move forward you got to set up your environment so you can move forward yeah that just and I, the other part I love is the no rules. <laughs> I love that part. Um, but thinking about what you just said, like I went, I left home when I was about like right after high school, I went to college and I haven't been home since. So like these, this idea of being a householder for, for young people that go away to college and then move into a tiny apartment and then begin to begin this household life. It's like, they don't under necessarily understand, like we're not taught how to maintain a household structure until we're thrown into it. So you think you want something, but you're not really given the opportunity to be like, I don't need a six bedroom house because this is gonna be a lot of upkeep, you know? And then they buy this house or they buy whatever and they stuff it full of junk. And then they realize, this house isn't going to make me happy and it's going to make me more miserable because I got to clean the whole thing. Yeah. Instead of being something that you enjoy, it turns out to be a pain in the butt. Because we think we, enjoy, we think something's going to make us happy, but we have to be, we, I mean, I think me and you are at a place where we know that stuff material is not going to make us happy. Like we have to be happy before we buy the house. Like we have to be happy with, and we have to be able to adjust. Like if you don't only get a four bedroom house instead of a six bedroom house, you're going to be happy in it and you're going to enjoy cleaning it because you're going to love it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like, that's like the two different people running around in the world. It's the people that are like us that are aware and, and enlightened to a certain degree and can find happiness and beauty in things that don't fit in this like box of, what is expected in life. Well, you know, I, I think you're, I certainly feel like I have greater awareness of it now than I did 30 years ago, but I still fall prey to that. So a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking to a woman 
who I greatly admire. Um, and uh, I needed a reference for somebody who was going to work with my son. This guy, who is great, by the way, works with her son. <clears throat> and uh, and I, I've known her because she's an advocate in the field. So um, cutting to the chase, she mentioned a book that she was using in helping to train staff working with her son. I immediately went to Amazon and bought this book. Did I need this book? I did not. <laughs> not only that, this is one of those books that drives me crazy. Oh. Um, it is, it is, it's not, it has good suggestions, but it's, it's very often, if you do it this way, your life will be wonderful. And it's sort of like, no, it won't. If you do it this way, it'll probably help in some areas, but this book is not going to make your life wonderful. Sorry, it's just not happening, you know? Um, and, but I did it based on the fact that this woman who I admired said that she was using it. So it's not bad that she was using it. It was meeting a need for her. But why did I do that? And that was getting a thing that was going to make my life better, which is now $15 sitting on a bookshelf. And who knows what I will ever do with this book. Yeah. And so I still fall prey to it. And, and uh, it's, it's as soon as the book was delivered, I thought, why did I do this? And, you know, and it's, at least I was self-aware after the fact, but boy. <laughs> yeah. I I'm not sure. I did that. Um, so if I find myself doing something like that, I hate wasting money. It's like my biggest pet peeve because I'm such, I, I like keep, I like budget myself and like I, I don't want to waste money because I like donating a lot of money. So if I waste money, then I feel like, Anyway, so if I, if I do something like that, I just find, I'm like, I'm going to find, I find it another home. Like it's not, I thank it in my home, but it's not welcome here anymore. And it'll go make somebody else happy because whether you donate it to like a Goodwill or to the library, at least now, like the next person, like the woman that really enjoys it can enjoy it. And it's almost like you're putting it out into the world. So yes. yeah. there's a reason why you bought it and it, <laughs> it provided this lesson. Um, but even like me buying, so when, when we started this book, I get in this, I get in this, like everything has to be perfect and everyone has to access this book and I have to read tomorrow. So let me go on Kindle. And I came up with this idea that I'll buy the book on Kindle and I'll screen share it. So I hate buying books on my Kindle. I think I have like one other book on my Kindle. Yeah. Cause I rent them all through the, I borrow them all through the library. Yep. <laughs> so now I have this nine ninety nine book on the Kindle that is fine, but I want the hard copy of it, but I don't want to buy a second copy of it because it's on my Kindle. And plus there was a free PDF out there that I should have just like thought to check for. Yeah. And all of this is fine. All, like that whole thing is totally fine. I've, I'm fine with it. But the fact that I spent like 20 minutes analyzing it the other day was such a waste of and like same with you like you're thinking about this book again and it's like negative it's like bringing this negative energy to it and sometimes I just have to say to myself I forgive myself for doing that and move on like and not just keep beating myself up over it it wasn't like a mis it wasn't like I was doing something out of bad intent yeah yeah, but I, I catch myself too. It's not, it's not, it's not a perfect, it's a practice. I'll say, I agree. I agree. Yeah. But it's, I'm starting to, I need to start adding cardio. This has been on my bucket list from the beginning of the year that I wanted to start doing. I have this cardio thing in my basement. And so I decided last night was going to be the night. So it's this whole idea of like, I like you do something and you shove everything in. Like, I'm like, I had to go for a walk. I had to make dinner. Like, I'm like, it's like overexerting yourself. I go do the, the thing. And I felt really good after I did it, but like, I'm, I feel it today, which is good. Yeah. And even when I'm doing it, I'm like, I'm not going as hard as the people on this tape. These people are expert workout things. Like, I don't want to be super sore that I can't get out of bed. Like this has to be a gradual. So I took breaks when I needed them and I didn't do the most extreme version. So like, I was proud of myself that I learned 
during that, that I don't, I can, like, even when I take yoga, I'm like, I can take child's pose more. I don't have to do every pose that everyone else is doing. Um, and I, I love learning that for myself where I don't have to like overexert myself so that I can't go on the rest of my day with stuff. Well, and, it's, it is, it is a good thing to realize that you're more self-aware, but at the same time, um, I realize how many of, how much of the old habits are still there. So we're having for the first time, a couple of people over tomorrow night. And it's supposed to be a nice night and we can sit on the deck and it'll, you know, it'll be, I think, maintaining health and, and also mental health because it's so nice to see friends. Yeah, of course. But I found myself obsessing for the past couple of days about what does the house look like? Do I need to clean things up? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because for six months, you yeah. know, it's been just us and not, we're not slobs and we like things picked up and, but... Uh, all of a sudden, I am horribly worried about what these two people who I've known for, I don't know, over 35 years, what they're going to think about me and how we keep up the house. Yeah. And it's sort of, uh, and then I thought, you know, stop. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's, it's nice to be more self-aware, but it's, I, I know some things are just going to be a part of me until I die. They're just there. Oh, and I yeah. just have to cope with them you know so oh, i i totally agree <laughs> like i'm uh, like thinking i'm like i should give my body a rest today but i'm like i won't because i definitely want to go to yoga and try to do another walk it's fine but i'll just take it easy you well, you're not talking about climbing a mountain, you're talking about a walk. So that's probably a, a good thing, a nice yeah, thing yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll see. Pam, before we move into breath work, I have to take a short break. Yeah. But I will be right back. Okay. Okay, thank you for your patience. <laughs> There's no rules. We're <laughs> good, good for you. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I too, I used to be very like, not like an OCD, but maybe like a borderline. And this yoga has allowed me to let go a little bit. So. But I, I too catch myself. Ugh. Well, one of the nice things about uh, yoga and meditation is that it kind of brings you back in. And it also allows you to 
be less self-punishing around yeah. that stuff. It really, there's something about it that builds acceptance, which yeah. means it's, it's not, and it's not just of your, yourself and your own foibles, but therefore of others as well, I think, so. Yeah, I agree. It allows you to start with you before you start reflecting on others, I guess, because you're so, you're becoming so aware. Yes. I yeah. do love the community it's brought me with. Yeah. Like I love majority of people in the yoga community. It was like, I finally felt like I found my people. I was like roaming around, like, where are my people? <laughs> where are my people? Right. Right. Like, these are not my people here. Right. You're right. But I found my people. True. It's true. And they become more forgiving. It's the way they treat you back too. It's not just the way you treat them. And it becomes like this cycle of encouragement. You know? I agree. I, uh, oh, I totally agree about that. It's, it's, it's very, it, it's more than reinforcing. It, it's, it's, it like, helps you to build on that kind of behavior when yeah. you get that kind of treatment from other people. Yeah. And you find yourself doing it more and it's, and it's sort of like this very positive cycle. So you're right. Yeah. Right. I hadn't I thought about that. Like what a, a kindergartner feels in a class. Like imagine like being a kindergartner in a class like Jackie's, you know, where it's like creating that that self-confidence, that way of, it, it made me feel like that as an adult where it was like, okay. Um, you know, okay. It, what you said reminded me of a, a principal who worked uh, in the agency where I used to work and she had she was the principal of a school where there were 28 different languages spoken and, and uh, most of the, all of the staff were from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds, you know, to meet the needs of the kids, et cetera. But that also meant that there were some clashes that came in. It wasn't just enrichment and, and broadening it. There were class, clashes. And she was absolutely aces at um, bringing people together uh, um, and at helping people to understand each other. And when you walked into that building, instead of feeling divisiveness and th like things were foreign, um, it was very welcoming and people were extraordinarily helpful. And families felt that too when they came in. And for a lot of the families, they were brand new to America. You know, they were immigrants and they had been here like seven weeks, you know, or three months max. And it made such a huge difference. Um, and it was because of the atmosphere that she set, basically from the top down, that's, you know, and, and she never allowed arguments between staff to exist. You know, they went right away to a really very supportive conflict resolution kind of thing. And it was, it was, uh, it was all based on on respect and listening. Yeah. And you know, in the in the best of the yoga community, that I think you're right, that's the case. Yeah. That's a beautiful story. I love that. That's yeah. how you know what's really sad about that story is that that principal who was pretty remarkable. Because she had a couple of people working with her who, her who were really abrasive and, and, you know, it could have gone in the other direction very easily. Um, she, she died years ago. She developed lung cancer and died years ago. And it was, you know, this was one of those things where you think, why her? <laughs> yeah. Because we need her. Um, yeah. But she was quite something. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move into our breath and then we'll meditate. Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> I'm going to set this down here. All right.
You are yawning. I know. The funny thing is, is I don't even feel as tired as I did the last two days. Like my body's just, you do feel it when your rhythm's off. That's why I love that chapter so much because I'm like, I can relate to this in my sleep right now. Yeah, no kidding. I, oh, okay. I, I think you're absolutely right. All right, I am setting up my, I'm ready. I'm all ready. Okay. Just taking three breaths in through the nose and out through the nose. Lengthening the breath, deepening the breath out. Now we'll begin our alternate nostril breathing. Closing right thumb, right nostril, right thumb, and inhale through your left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Inhale left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Taking three more rounds on your own breath. Finishing on your left side, taking your time. Set the timer for 20 minutes. If you need to set your own timer, go ahead.
bringing hands to heart. Namaste.